Tech Computer Geek here. So today we're going to be tearing into Main Mudmar. We're going to see if we can fire him up while we're here. Unfortunately, I think his engine may be seized from sitting. He kind of got dunked underwater for about the fourth time and parked afterwards. And I'm not quite sure whether he's going to run again. He's also on his fourth or fifth transmission in the rear right now. I kind of lost track, and it doesn't seem to be moving, so we're going to see if it's brake seized up, or maybe there was water in the transmission. The other part of this video is going to be a show-all, tell-all. Um, I'm going to grab the camera, we're going to do a walk around as far as the upper stuff and things, show you any tricks or modifications that I made that might have been missed in other videos, and go from there. Also. To the people on my last video that decided to go and talk about video quality and microphone quality. It actually turns out that my microphone in this camera is dying. Um, I compared the audio from that clip to other clips that have been done in the same place and it's atrocious. Thank you very much for showing me. Uh, there's a new camera in the works and new editing software along with new shirts and a coffee mug so that I can stay warm out here with you guys. So with that being said, I'm going to go and grab the camera and do a walk around. Oh, I get asked about the Furby all the time. The answer is, when I first started doing YouTube videos, a gentleman who I work with also does YouTube videos. And totally unrelated, he does gun videos. But... One day at work, we were dealing with my son and his Furby, and he decided to say, you know what, I bet you won't put this in a video. Well, they've been randomly in videos ever since. People enjoy looking for them. I enjoy having the parents that tell me their kids go hunting for Furbies in every video. So the Furbies are here to stay. I'm actually looking for other color Furbies. So if you have one you want to get rid of, I got a P.O. box, it's 131 Belfast, Maine, 04915. Just title it Redneck Computer Geek, they know me there. Alright, let's grab a camera. Alright, I really hate grabbing cameras and doing walk-arounds because that's when you end up with all kinds of shaky footage. But here we go. A lot of people ask about the winch mount. So I'll do an upper showing and then I'll do a lower showing later. And basically what we have here is through this really large bar, which is uh, one and a quarter, and it's actually really thick steel because I wanted something eventually I could make a pin hitch in, but I never ended up doing that because it just, I ended up doing my plow gear differently. And so what we have here is this hole here, and it goes all the way through, so you can put a long extended bolt there. And then what I did here was in underneath, I welded the nut in, so it made a captive nut. And you can just barely fit the extended ratchet down past this in order to put a grade 8 bolt in. So that's how it is my winch mount. I put it up in here. The exhaust doesn't seem to affect the winch motors at all. Um, it never gave mine any issue, and having the winch as far back here, it ends up acting as a shield so nothing ends up hitting the exhaust and breaking it out and stuff like that. The other thing I'll point out while I'm right here is this. This was one of my worst ideas ever in mud mower history. As you can see, the whole entire front is shattered and stuff, and that's because all of this moves. Without a question, it was one of my worst ideas ever, was to weld this on and have it slide in here. And the reason I did this was because I wanted a quick remove hood. I wanted something that I could just, I could just pull it and pull the whole thing off and have it work. But what ended up happening was instead it ended up making like a spring effect. And the whole thing, if, the whole thing, if you hit a bump just right, would just flip right up and I smashed it and everything else and the other problem was is you couldn't fit the winch so I had to slice out all of that which made it lose some more structural integrity so my resolution to that was this not back here move Furby was this back here and this is just a bolt 
with a washer on the top. And what I did was I took my drill and I lined it up and I drilled straight through the top of the hood. So I drilled straight through the top of the hood and then I kept drilling through. And then I found a bolt that would fit from here all the way through to the hole underneath. And then what I did was I put the bolt through, put the nut on the other side with about that much thread sticking through the nut. And what that let me do was in underneath here, I don't know if we can see it, the bolt is right there. So in underneath there, I could hit that with the tip of my welder. So the bolt set in and through the hole and then I hit that nut with the tip of my welder and I welded it the rest of the way on. I'll take a better picture of that later. So while we're here, we'll take a look at the gas pedal. It's a Mr. Gasket Prograde gas pedal. They're actually advertised as being rock crawler or standard off-road gas pedals. And I'll post a link for the video of this in the description. But basically what I ended up running into was that the throw on it was too much for my tiny little carburetor. Because keep in mind, this is made for a big V8. So the throw on it was too much. So what I ended up doing was I ran this bolt through where the mount bolt was so I could run it back and then I put a captive nut right here right there you can see this captive nut and then I put a regular bolt through the top of that and what I did was I figured out basically where it was that I wanted it and then I pulled this bolt out and I sanded down the inside of it so that it squares off to the pedal when it comes down and wants to stay there and that works pretty good. Um, my one complaint about this is that the cable that comes with it is actually very short. So it runs up and onto the motor and a little closer to things than I would like. So in the future, I'm going to see if I can find a compatible cable that's longer for this. But otherwise than that, it works great. Um, it's not spring return. So you have to set your boot down in here and then flex your foot in order to return it. But in all honesty, I like that because it acts partially like a clutch pedal on a stock tractor also. Because if I slam this down and I, and I just casually kind of hold my foot there and let off, it'll actually hold the throttle until it hits a really major bump and this thing comes back up. So if you're on a long stretch of trail or something and you set it down and you just happen to go and just lift your foot off, it'll keep going unless you actually slam the, the piece down in the bottom. These are 16 inch X-Tracks and I've actually got another set of them over here. And we're going to pull these off and see what the inside of them look, look like because I'll show you on these ones. What I did on those extracts was I cut this off so that it would fit onto the spindle. And I ended up inserting the thickest DOM um, copper pipe that I could find inside. And I found I could buy, I think it was like a two foot section of copper pipe for, I don't know, it was like eight bucks or something like that. And one piece of copper pipe I could make, I think it was 10 bushings out of. So every every two or three months of constant use i'd have to pull the c-clip and pop this off punch out the copper pipe punch a new one in and then put it back on but what we have here is we've got bushings that we're going to be installing and what you're going to say is hey um that doesn't fit well no that doesn't fit but a piece of cast iron pipe like this see if it'll focus there we go piece of cast iron pipe like this if you go in they're not all the same diameter so you need to go and pop open the end when the sales manager isn't looking and test your bearings inside the the inside of it you can't just plain go buy one of these pipes what i discovered the hard way was it took me five different tries to find a pipe that was the right internal diameter 
So that's going to get welded on just like the video for the gas powered power wheel and those front tires. I'll post a link for that in the description as well. That's what I'm going to build for main mud mower. That's the way it should be done. This is junk. Don't do it this method. Wait for me to do that. I'll make another how-to. Alright, so another thing everybody always has issues with these Craftsmen is these stupid plastic things. And the pins and the uh, press ends on the sides and stuff, they all fail. So what I end up doing is I take and I drill a self-tapping screw right through here and I put a washer on it and that keeps it on there. You know, yes, it's ugly, but it works. This right here, that's my that's my lights, and I got one with the LED in the end and paid the extra because of the fact that I kept hitting the original light switch with my kneecap, and I would end up draining my battery. These are weather resistant, not weather proof. Weather resistant push buttons. And right now it does nothing because there's something majorly wrong in the electrical. And this is an on-off switch, which I use as my kill switch. Now when you go to install these, as you'll notice right now, it's set to the off. But off is on and on is off if you ever use one of these because this little plate piece is keyed. And so when you go to wire it in, you have to wire it in as on is off and off is on. They'll make more sense when you get into wiring. This is my winch controller I ended up using because it made plowing a lot easier. And I did plow for three winters with this and I shattered a couple of different transmissions, including one that I've got right here, I believe, where I've only seen two other mud mower guys do this, where they shatter the entire gear assembly pre rear shaft. So here's your gear assembly where your shifter is and here is where this is supposed to connect and it's all broken right off. I've only seen one or two other people do that. Um, these are Kendra bear claws and they've become really famous in the mud mower world over the last couple of years because of their capability. I really love them as far as mud running is concerned, but I honestly would not recommend them if you're going to run gravel trail or stuff like that. Um, what I discovered was hard pack gravel. This thing essentially just turns into a drift cart in fifth gear. And you can't get these tires to get grip on hard pack. Um, they'll grip fine on pavement. They will grip amazing on grass and stuff like that they will rip the snot out of grass. So be careful you're not crossing areas and giving it gas that people don't want torn up because that's what these will do. Um, Snow-wise, snow -wise they're great. Um, I've seen a lot of guys wrap tires in snowmobile tread. And to be honest, after viewing their videos and after doing what I've done with the Kendras, I think these are just as good in snow probably a little bit less than the snowmobile tread idea. Um, while we're here, we've got the back rack and I've got this pole on the back rack. And a lot of people have asked why it is that there's not trail riding video and blah, blah, blah from that. And the reason being is because I didn't put it on there for trail riding videos of myself. I put it on there so that I could set my camera on this little adapter here and be able to point it down the trail to get pictures of other people. Essentially carrying a tripod got too much of a hassle so this became my mobile tripod. Now while we're also here on this rack, one thing about my rack is I never squared it off to here and the reason being was because I found a lot of times I ended up having to actually sit back over the seat sometimes in order to lift the front end to get out of certain mud holes. 
And by having squared off edges, I had something I may or may not end up falling onto. Whereas by having the rack with a triangular cut to it, I knew if I fell back onto it that I wasn't going to jab myself in the side if I fell off or something like that. The other thing that I've had a lot of people point out is this little bar here. And what this bar is, is I used to have a gas tank that fit exactly from here to there and from here to there. And so I could take and put a bungee cord from there through the gas tank and around that and it would sit perfectly right here. You see it in a lot of my older videos. And then in this side, I had a cooler that sat here. And the cooler worked okay, but I learned from the cooler that it didn't have a locking top, which meant sometimes if you hit a bump just right, it would pop open. And in the future, I will use ammo boxes or a toolbox, whatever I can find cheaper. Um, originally, I did make the rack bolt-on and removable, but what I found was that it rattled too much. And you could actually hear it in all my videos and it became really irritating while you were driving it. So eventually I just said the heck with it and I welded it totally solid on both of those. And the other thing is, is that means that I can lift the whole unit using the rack. Now, while we're here, I'll point out, a lot of people ask, how did I register it as an ATV? Well, first of all, you got to deal with your ATV legalized stuff that you need. Lights. Now, this is the state of Maine. Lights. Rear brake light or running red light. Muffler. Spark respirator. So, what I did was I registered it as the make being Craftsman and the model number being LT1000 and then I registered this number here as its VIN and they allowed me to register it because I had pictures of it fully set up I made sure I had pictures of the muffler set up. I made sure I had pictures of a tape measure from here to here to prove it wasn't more than 60 inches wide, which is another main regulation. And then paid my $35. I get a lot of people asking what battery I run. It's the Duralast 425. Um, this is actually the third one that I've used at this point. And they're awesome. And the reason why I really, really like these in a cold climate is they are so powerful that in an emergency, I can usually jumpstart most vehicles if they got their lights left on or something like that. This has enough cranking amp to boost just about any small vehicle. And that's a nice thing to have in survival type scenarios. Um, the seat is the original to the machine and it's horrible and it's torn up and it stabs me but that just keeps me on my toes the new one on the mud wizard is in far better condition and people ask me about the shift and whether i like it or i hate it and the answer is as a six foot one guy i like it because my knee is all the way over up in here and I can reach in underneath and I can shift. And the other thing is, is most of the time if I'm shifting, I'm downshifting into second or third in order to pull out of a mud hole. And I've already got to be bent over in order to be able to throw my weight into it to get the front end up. So the fact that I'm shifting and already have to be bent over doesn't bother me at all because I've got to go and bend over and throw my weight to get the front tires up. Uh, let's see. I do run the stock clutch and brake controls, but what I've done is I've set it so that it's um, the clutch disen the clutch disengages with about five degrees before the brake engages. So what that does 
is it allows you that when it's up, you've got full clutch on. At a certain point, you've got full neutral to both. And at a certain point down, you've got full braking. And that's essentially just the simple version of how a standard transmission truck drives. So that's the way I set up mine. There's a drawback to that. And the drawback to that is that you lose part of your braking power because the stock, your braking happens far sooner. So by pushing the braking so that it happens later, you lose part of your braking power. So that's the reason why it is I always am replacing my rear brake pads with newer, better pads. Um, while we're here, I've also got the gas throttle. And a lot of people ask me why it is I still have the gas throttle if I have the uh, foot throttle. And the reason being is because this right here I have set into its lock-in choke position. This is connected to the choke on the carburetor. So right now it's set to its normal run, and if I push it up across here, it actually actuates the choke on the carb. So in cold weather, I can still be able to start this even though it's got a gas throttle, which is what a lot of people complain about, is that once it gets below a certain temperature, they can't start it. The steering wheel is stock. It is a second gen steering system that's in this unit. And as with most of them, it's got a little bit of play, but the second gen steering is way better than the first gen. If you're going to run one of these Craftsman's, you need second gen steering. There is a third generation steering type that has come out. I do intend to try and find a machine with that this year to play with it. We'll see what we can do about that. Oh, the front end. A lot of people have pointed that out and I'm gonna lift the tractor now and we'll take a look at that. But the real sad moment right now in this video is that engine won't turn over. So, what we're going to do right now is we're going to lift the machine, take a look at some things underneath, and then we're going to see if we can make that engine run. So I get asked a lot why it is that in a lot of my videos I'm wearing rubber gloves, even though it's not a greasy video or something. And a little bit of personal info about myself, I'm actually allergic to the Kevlar that's in higher end belts. Um, I'm allergic to Kevlar that's in a lot of automotive insulation and things like that. And if I don't wear the gloves and I get it on me, I end up looking like alligator skin. So that's why the rubber gloves all the time, guys. All right. So to get the hood open on main mud bar, like I said, this is one of my worst ideas ever, the way that I did that front pin setup. You just undo this, and what I found was great about the washer was that I could pre-roll part of the winch up on here and be able to connect it to this, and that meant if I needed it, I already had a good solid four or five feet that were out and available to run it. Now while we're here actually, let's talk about the winch that was on here. The winch that was on here was one of these LT2000 super Sorry, winch. I had to turn down the furnace. So the winch that was on here was one of these um, LT2000 super winches. Now for what this was designed for, it says ATV use, but I really honestly have to wonder because what I discovered was that because this piece of metal here does not actually come over the top of this drum roll, a lot of times this loves to jump over into this side and just ruin what it is you're doing. And the only way to get it to come out of there once it jumps into that is you have to go and take the whole entire winch assembly off. You have to remove this one, this one, in order to pull this plate to remove this, to be able to re-spool the winch, 
Now the winch is 25, it's got 25 feet worth of cable on it. So you've got to haul all of that cable off of there, away from you, and have another person take jumper cables to this to be able to re-spool it, to be able to put the plate back on, to be able to put the nub back on, to be able to use the winch again. It's not something you can do in the woods, and that's why I have decided to stop using these. I'll probably be using either Champions, like what's on the back of my GT6000, main Munmore 2.0. I did a video on that winch also, and that's what I'll probably use from here on out. And the reason for that is because it's got a bar from here to here and here to here on the top of the winch. And it makes a giant difference when you're pulling up really large weights. So anyways, with that said, basically I put this back into the bolt hole here. Grab the two sides of the hood and lift off. And undo the wiring for the lights. Now, when I first did the uh, lighting on this, LED lights were really, really, really expensive back then. So the lighting on this is actually fog lights off for a truck. And it worked really, really well, but it added a lot of weight to the hood that didn't need to be there. I do have another set of LED, I do have a set of LED lights for the next build. I'll show those later in the next video. So what we have here is we've got our engine assembly set up and I'm going to grab the camera and show you one or two things as far as this goes. On this side what I wanted to show you is that I use the stock connectors and I did that on purpose and that's because these 15.5 to like 17.5 Briggs are everywhere. They're all over the place and they all basically use the same exact harness. So I did this on purpose even though a lot of people give me issue about it and what I do is I Vaseline the snot out of the connectors when I know that I'm going to be going off-roading for a while and then it keeps them clean and that way in order to swap the engine if I ever wanted to I just would unplug this throw the next engine on and go which makes it basically one plug one gas line one line for the one power lead for the starter and the carbon choke connections I always take my um, spark plug and I pull the boot off and yet again I put in um, sealant on that and put it back on I use Vaseline around the outside edge of it and then slide it over so that that way it'll stay sealed even when it goes underwater now I get a lot of flack for this that I have this cut open but there's a reason for that and the reason being is this right here now normally the box comes out to here and at first what I did was I just sliced this off well that still didn't work because every time water would get into the flywheel when you'd get really deep in water it would suck water into the flywheel and it would shoot it over here and it would bounce off and go straight into the filter and kill the engine. Like I said, this thing's been underwater a few times. So, I sliced this off. Well, the problem is this plastic piece here was still here and it would create fog and it would come in and eventually this would soak up and it would still end up failing. So what I did was I sliced it off right here and I sliced it off right here so that now this sucks air right directly through the front of it and this when it blows out blows way past it and doesn't end up sending any of the water vapor into this or at least a lot less than what it did now in all honesty if I really wanted to take this one step further I would have put a panel here so that this actually blew out this way but I was worried about the idea of coating the front of the motor 
this area with water. I'd rather it just splash out through and hit the hood than end up coating the rest of it. I do run the solenoid delete, which is what any off-roader really should be running. Um, like I said, it's the second carb on here in its second rebuild. And we've got our regular fuel line like we always do. I like having the clear filters, which is not clear because it's been through hell. And over here, we've got our gas pedal set up. And this is in my video, but what I ended up doing was I took the through bolt and I heated it up with a torch and then I pressed it into the plastic piece. And then once it was into the plastic piece and it solidified around it, I went back through and I put five ton epoxy around it to make sure that it stayed. And that's how this works. And this is just a regular random return spring like you normally would do. And remember the throttle up here, that comes down through over and around and then hooks right here to our choke. And so right now it's set for standard run temp and when it pushes forward, it sets it for full choke to start when it's cold. This is the pull start that I set up. It worked really, really well until I was plowing with this the very last time I ever used it to plow. And something weird happened. I hit a snowbank going way faster than I usually do. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the engine made really, really bad noises. And it didn't stop, but it had this weird grinding noise. And that weird grinding noise was this piece here exploding off of the side of the, the motor. But the funny thing is, is it still worked. So I just left it, which it's not working right now because the motor is seized up for some reason, but we'll figure that out next. All right, well, please excuse the furnace because it's rather cold out right now. But basically, I take a length of rope that's about four, four and a half feet or so long with two loops in it. And I loop through the sides of the axle and over the top of the, over the top of the spindle. And then from there, I throw this on. And it's just a regular half ton. And lift it up. So you might be asking why it is I haven't decided to go and work on the engine yet. And that's because of something I wanted to show people. See these Kevlar belts, these blue ones? I don't know what it is about these blue Kevlar belts, but they have a habit for some reason of holding water and rust welding themselves to the sides of the pulleys and they actually will outright lock up your system. So what I'm going to end up doing is pulling that belt entirely off be the uh, front before I try and fire up the motor. But what I wanted to show here was actually this particular pulley here. This is stock. This is the stock size with an upgraded rim size to be metal. These normally would have been plastic except for I kept exploding the plastic ones. This is not stock. And what this is, is it's a belt keeper with a V pulley. And what I did was I drilled, a, I drilled a hole through here and I drilled another hole and what that does is it lets me run anywhere from a 92 to a 93, no, 91 to a 93 inch belt. And 
the reason being is for some reason the 91s were hard to find. And so by putting this in, I could run a 93 inch belt. And the other thing that this did was it brought the line over so that my shifter was less likely to hit with my five inch pulley on the rear. So what I have right now is I have a five on the rear and I have a five and a half deck pulley here. Um, actually, this is a deck drive pulley that's been welded up and over. I did a video on this, how to flip these. I'll post that in the link as well. And that right there is also another deck drive pulley off of the bottom of a motor because they have the bigger flanges on the sides. And that worked out really, really well for me. It's actually the original setup. I've never changed that. And it looks as if it's a, it's an MS203 that I upgraded to an MST205 or 6. And this is another thing that I discovered along the way after reading up with a bunch of people is the MST203 uh, is the exact same case as 204, 205, and 206. So you can buy the 203 and sell out all the time in order to get the brand spanking new cases, um, the exterior and the rear axle, the bull gear, and the spiders, and then swap your drive gear inside to whatever speed type you had before when you end up breaking a transaxle. So the other thing I wanted to point out while we're right here is the Dell skid plate and the way that this comes down. And the other thing I'll show you is anywhere there was a joining piece in the original plate frame, I welded it. And that gave it a structural rigidity that it didn't have before. Before the whole frame would twist as I was doing stuff. And sometimes it would twist to the point it would even jump belts. So by welding all of these seams anywhere I found them on the chassis, it made a huge difference in making the frame way more rigid. So this comes down, and this comes down to a bar, and I left this open on purpose. And what it did was it allowed me to be able to put stuff into here and pin it so that I could have a plow gear, I could have a front scoop, I could have all of this stuff. Now, this plate here I put on that comes back in order to shield the muffler and everything. The big thing about this is that I love it and I would do it again in a heartbeat because I made it so it was in line with the level of this. So everything skids on this before it ever even attempts to hit this. And because this skid plate is at the same level, most of the time it just glides right across. And the other thing while we're here is cast iron front ends. This is a cast iron axle. And you can find these in the Craftsman's that are Hydros from the 1990s. And I believe some of the newer ones are coming out with these cast irons also. This is what you want. The stamp metal front ends, you can run them, but you need to weld and reinforce them over and over again, and they still will end up blowing out. Where they blow out is, they blow out right on this seam right here on the pressed steel front ends. And what it does is the spindle torques and this top piece here all of a sudden splays out, and next thing you know, it pops this top piece off and the whole spindle drops out when you're not looking or it twists and the tractor just kind of drives itself in whatever direction it wants to. Um, the other thing is I get a lot of people saying it's a square front, why the triangle? And the reason for that was because I didn't want to plow stuff ahead of me. I wanted it to naturally go off to the sides. And so by making it with the angle coming up and the two sides coming off, it allowed water and mud an area to escape one side or the other, rather than just plowing up and making a big giant ball in front of it. At this point, I'm going to get in and drop that belt out, and 
We're gonna see if we can pull the spark plug and make the motor turn over. Oh, I thought of one more thing that needed to be in this front end section, and that's this. This was upgraded in one of my very first fail videos with this. And what happens is this particular bar going across is really, really thin metal, and it's not very good high grade. And the moment you start applying any kind of torque sideways on bigger tires, this bends and it bends up in and it smashes into your drive pulley, making horrible noises. And it actually happened to me live in a video. I'll see if I can post a link for that. And I ended up welding this on in order to set it up. Now, I've had a lot of people end up changing this idea out for angle. And I tried this once myself. And I ended up going back to my old bar. And here's the reason. I messed up. And what I ended up doing was I ended up welding it on like this. And what that ended up doing was creating a catch scoop that caught everything. And it would rig up on stuff, it would catch things, and it would rack my steering and everything else. So what the guys have figured out over the years is you need to put it on like this which means you hold it up to the bar, you tack it a couple of times on the ends here, tack it a couple of times on the other side, and what that does is it gives you a skid plate so that it comes up and over the top of stuff. As you can see there, you just glide across it versus scooping in like a bulldozer. So, I wanted to show you guys this. I got a blast heater here aimed at the transmission and the reason being is I'm pretty sure that it is full of water and therefore it's frozen inside. And I wasn't quite sure until all of a sudden I started seeing that come out of it. That's a puddle of water that's actually draining from this. So there's probably a crack in the case somewhere unfortunately, but we'll see. Maybe it'll unthaw and come loose. All I know is right now it free rolls. Now, you guys asked me about bracing, and the real reality is, this is your stock bar here, and I've bent them a couple of times, but, you know, they're not too hard to bend back. This is the one that sucks. And so what I ended up doing was I welded in a triangular piece on both sides, and then welded down across for where the bolt goes. And that's the one that I always ended up breaking. So I welded that triangle piece in, never had an issue since. Um, I do have just the regular stock mounts on the rear, and there are people that have made um, pillow block bearing catches on the back. I'll post up some photos of Donald's, and his is amazing. You really should take a look at his builds and they put pillow blocks on either side and I think that's really awesome. Um, not sure how that affects getting the transmission in and out because I can literally drop and swap an entire transmission in a matter of minutes with this setup. That's part of why I like it. But for now we're gonna keep blasting this with heat, see if that top pulley will free up. The rear already freed up so I know it was just ice on the inside. And I've got another curiosity thing going on here. So, remember that whole, the belt's rust solid and then you can't get anything to go? I pulled the belt, pulled the spark plug wire out, and there we go. So, we've confirmed we have spark and we have compression. So as soon as I get a little bit further into this transmission, we'll see what we can do.